Welcome back. Previously on Administrative Law, we continued our study of rulemaking procedures. What should we take away? The only procedural elements the APA requires of agency rulemaking are those sound found in Section 553. Congress and the agencies themselves may require more. Courts normally may not. Broadened APA Section 553 requirements as to adequacy of notice and responsiveness to comments survive, but not those intended to graft Section 556-57 elements onto Section 553. APA Section 553 requires that legislative rules be promulgated by following notice and comment procedures. APA Section 553 accepts interpretive rules, policy statements, and rules of procedure from notice and comment promulgation. A rule that amends, revokes, or is inconsistent with a prior legislative rule is itself legislative. An interpretive rule is a rule derived from a textual source by a method for clarifying what that text already means. A rule that stipulates a quantity to make a qualitative norm more specific typically is legislative. Rules made pursuant to a statute that does not itself impose duties on the public are typically legislative, for there is no statutory duty to interpret. Recall the distinction between interpretive rules and so-called legislative rules. Drawing a line between them is not easy, but the best advice comes from Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit. A rule is an interpretive rule only if it can be derived from what it interprets by a process reasonably described as interpretation. A process of interpretation is often one assisted by the use of the traditional tools of construction. These tools are most familiar to us as they come into play in statutory construction consulting ordinary or dictionary meaning, considering the author's purpose, taking into account the linguistic context. Some of these tools have names, such as noscitur associis, which means birds of a feather flock together. Roughly speaking, this means that if an ambiguous term occurs in a list of other terms, the meaning assigned to the ambiguous term should match the meaning common to the other terms. For example, the word bank can mean financial institution, or it can mean riparian boundary. Consider these two lists. A. Any watercourse, channel, bank, canal, dike, or levee. B. Any clearinghouse, depository, bank, credit union, or lending institution. Obviously, bank has different meanings in A and in B. Noscitur associis indicates that in A, bank means riparian boundary, and in B, financial institution. The maxim tells us not only to pay attention to context, but what to make of it. Eustem generis, and things of the kind. This comes into play when something is not mentioned, but is similar to something that is. For example, a statute might mention automobiles, trucks, and buses, but not off-road vehicles. Eustem generis advises us to consider that the legislature may have intended to include relevantly similar vehicles. Depending on the context, it might be natural to consider off-road vehicles as covered as well, but probably not motorboats. And also recall another canon. Expressio unius est exclusio alterius, which means including one excludes others. We saw this one in action in the Block v. Community Nutrition Institute case. Including judicial review for handlers excluded it for consumers. And who could forget Bowen v. Michigan Academy, where including judicial review under Medicare Part A did not exclude it under Medicare Part B. You might wonder, how can a eustem generis, include things of the same kind, be reconciled with inclusio unius exclusio alterius, 
Mentioning one thing excludes things not mentioned, even if of the same kind. Alas, pursuit of that very good question would take us far afield. Let it suffice to say that none of these canons of construction purports to be conclusive. Ultimately, the issue is also always one of the drafter's intent. Canons serve as tools to help us uncover what the lawmaker meant by the words chosen. We do not have time to examine or even to list all the maxims that belong to the canons of construction. But let's add one more tool to our tool chest. The rule of the last antecedent. It is a rule that comes into play when a text, like a statute or a regulation, lists several nouns or noun phrases and also mixes in qualifiers. The issue often arises, to which of the noun phrases in the list does the qualifying phrase apply? The rule of the last antecedent tells us how to interpret this kind of language. The late Justice Scalia was a master of the canons of statutory construction. As he explained it in the case of Barnhart v. Thomas, the rule of the last antecedent means that a limiting clause or phrase should ordinarily be read as modifying only the noun or phrase that it immediately follows. Or, put in language of an authority the opinion quotes, Referential and qualifying words and phrases, where no contrary in intention appears, refer solely to the last antecedent. Justice Scalia gave this homely example. Suppose Junior's parents are going away for the weekend, and as they leave, they tell him, Junior, you will be punished if you throw a party or engage in any other activity that damages the house. The parents leave. Junior throws a party, but there is no damage to the house. When the parents return, they find out about the party. Would it be fair to punish Junior? Consulting the rule of the last antecedent, we get this preliminary result. Yes, the qualifier that damages the house applies to other activity, but not to throw a party. This checks out with common sense. Risk of damage to the house might have been one reason to forbid a party, but it needn't have been the only kind of bad consequence in view. What happens at the party might not stay at the party, if you know what I mean. We could visualize the rule this way. The trailing qualifier naturally attaches to the phrase it immediately follows. If it didn't, and it was at the end of a sentence, it wouldn't limit or qualify anything. But to attach to some other phrase upstream in the sentence, it has to fight against the current, like a salmon swimming upstream to spawn. The rule tells the salmon, or the limiting clause, that it's okay to stop at the nearest antecedent. Justice Scalia applied the rule in Barnhard v. Thomas this way. The Social Security Act awards disability benefits to a claimant who was unable to do her previous job or any other job existing in the national economy. The claimant had been an elevator operator. She was injured, and by the time she had recovered, there were no more jobs to be had anywhere operating elevators. But the ALJ found that her medical condition had so improved that she could do her old job and found her not disabled. The claimant appealed on the ground that the agency had not found that she could do a job existing in the national economy. Should the agency have to show the claimant can do some other job in the national economy? A court of appeals agreed with her, but the Supreme Court reversed. All the statute required was a finding that she could do her old job. It did not require a finding that she could do a job that exists in the national economy. The modifier existing in the national economy applies to other job, but not to previous job. Common sense is not offended by this reading because Congress could have assumed that if a claimant could do her old job again, then she could find something else to do in the national economy. One more example. This is a textbook example of the rule of the last antecedent in operation. Suppose a regulation says, 
A commercial vehicular license is not needed for boats, tractors, and trucks under three tons. Does a four-ton truck need a license? Well, yes. Does a four-ton boat need a license? No. The qualifier under three tons applies to trucks, but not to boats or tractors. The rule of the last antecedent has us check our preliminary answer against common sense. Consider one last example. Let's say this sign is posted on an old bridge. Trucks, tractors, and RVs over three tons may not proceed beyond this point. May a four-ton RV proceed? No. May a two-ton truck proceed? Hmm. Common sense suggests that the three-ton limit was meant to swim back upstream. The rule of the last antecedent always has us check our preliminary answer against common sense. But having the provisional answer that we can get by using the rule's mechanics can be a great help in interpreting the word salads that lawmakers so often serve up.